Hello, welcome everyone to a celebration of creative writing from the writers of two sections of not one, double the fun, two sections of poetry and memoir. I'm Lainey Brown, your host for this evening. And um, I want to start by giving a shout out to everybody who is kindling the first lights of Hanukkah tonight, Chag Sameach. It's my COVID brain did not realize when I picked this date back in September that this was the first night. Um, but I too, am going to be lighting candles and eating latkes when we're done. So happy holidays. And it's a great segue to what I wanted to say to introduce these writers and this event and the wonderful works that you are going to hear, be hearing tonight. So in so many celebrations, in the winter, in the longest nights of the year, we wonder how do we get energized? How do we kindle that inner flame, that inner spark? And how can we be light in facing the unknown? So how to show up and dedicate ourselves to what matters the most and to remember that whether we're walking into a dark night um, or if we're just closing our eyes and entering a different space, then how do we translate that experience, um, the inner images and the epiphanies and the fears and all of it with absolute freedom? How do we get that to the page? How do we share that through language? So the good news that I'm here to tell you tonight is that is exactly what all of these remarkable writers have done. Um, everybody here, and also all the writers in the class who couldn't be here tonight, not only did they show up for class, do all of the assignments, um, leave their cameras on, <laughs> but they also, a lot more happened. Um, and they, made a really big effort to be present, to listen to each other, and the conversations that have begun this semester are going to continue on um, between these writers. And so that is such a bright light for me in the winter, that this is the case, that this is what's happening. Um, on the very first day of class, I asked everybody why they were here, what brought them here, and pretty much everybody said, well, I'm here because I love writing and I want to continue to deepen my practice, or I'm really interested in writing, but I've never had time to, to make it a regular practice. And now that I've started reading all the final portfolios that have come in, I'm reading the statements that people are saying, and that's exactly what happened. Um, I Everybody here created a space for uh, dedicated writing practice. And so I find it to be um, super inspirational. And the other thing I wanted to say is that we're not just little squares on a Zoom screen. <laughs> for us and for everybody watching some something happened that um all of the writers in this class they managed to transcend these little zoom squares so something magically is connecting all of us to each other through our writing and that's that is really miraculous and i'm really grateful for all of that so thank you writers for being here and thank you family and friends who are watching now or who might watch later. We're so happy that you're here. So just a note on how the evening will progress. Um, we're gonna go in alphabetical order, sort of, because some people have other commitments. Um, I will read the list of writers so that everybody knows the order. And then I will do intro for each writer and the writer will read for between five and seven minutes. And then I'll introduce the next writer and that's it. Um, yeah, 
So here we go. So first, the order. Our writers reading tonight are Julia Rubens, Jared Elters Dempsey, Sophia DeRose, Isabella Zhang, Mia Marion, Mir Elias, Maria Elena Mukiel, Olivia Dwyer, Jill Pesci, Victoria Sindelinger, and Paula Vecker. So our first reader tonight, Julia Rubens writes, this is my first time taking a creative writing class at Penn. A COVID pastime I would recommend is learning how to bake chocolate chip banana bread and carrot cake. So please help me to welcome Julia. Thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, I'm Julia and I'm gonna be reading an autobiographical piece called Years Unwritten and it's inspired by many of the authors that we discussed this semester. Um, and for those of you in my section, you've heard this one before. So years unwritten. One, the year of everything and nothing. I can't remember which. The year I was an exquisite exhibit admired by wide-eyed strangers. The year I was a miracle, a second child, a bundle of barefoot beginnings, untouched and anonymous to the dangers of the world. Two, the year of exponential exploration. The year gravity was a graceless choreography of tangled limbs of dipped toes in deep waters while holding large hands. A year told through firsts and milestones that seem to happen to me. Three, no means no, use your words. If you want me to use my words, then teach them to me, please. The year I watched my mom laugh so hard that she cried for the first time. The year I learned crying wasn't always a bad thing. The year I learned red wine stains and injuries scar a story told in zigzag dents on my forehead from spinning around in circles with too much excitement. Four, the year I learned what sharing was and how much I hated it. She was small with dark features and her name was Valerie, they said. I was to protect her. The year of placemats with portraits of faces I have now forgotten, of matching floral outfits and apple sippy cups and cold kitchen floors and ballet slippers sleeping bags. Five, one, two, three, four, five. The year I learned how to count, before negative numbers existed, praised for primal tasks and stumped by anything beyond. Triangle sandwich quarters filled dark blue lunch boxes stashed with special notes and folded surprises, crafted and packed with love. Six, pink jumpers so we all looked the same. Boys in pants, girls in dresses. The year one girl in my class wore khakis and the rest asked questions, before malintent was in our DNA. The year my cheeks stung with red shame and heavy regret when I had to apologize to my neighbors for throwing water bottles out the window. Seven, the year my friend Lauren copied everything I did. The year someone told me I was smart for the first time. Tracing paper, cursive notebooks, and spelling bees meant it was Friday, and colored squares insulated by thick lamination told me whether it was Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Eight, the playground of poised popularity. Insiders and outsiders climbed red structures in unison with common ground in the form of blisters, splinters, and visits to the angry nurse for a pity pretzel. Judy was her name. The year attention was a currency and I learned that we couldn't all be rich. Nine, the year parents started getting divorced. The year firefly phones with three buttons made of opaque plastic made me beg my mother to leave my father. I had to be included in the trend. The year I ate too many snacks and became aware that you weren't beautiful just because your parents said you were. 10, the year I had my first crush and played basketball even though I didn't like it. I wore neon orange tank tops so that I could stand out and wasted away the hours of the night watching statuses change on iChat. I laughed at jokes that weren't funny and believed in fate for five minutes when rumors spread that Max liked me back. 11, you can't fix ugly. The year I was so self-conscious that I used a contraption of mirrors to study my nose every night. I Googled plastic surgery and parted my hair on the side so as to distract from my wicked features. Acne and rotating pink and green braces were my white flag of surrender. The year I finally noticed myself in mirrors and wished that I hadn't. 12, the year I dated Mark and slammed my computer shut when he messaged me XOXO for the first time. 
The year I dumped him because he called my hair fuzzy in the auditorium. The year I discovered the thrill of talking about people behind their backs. The year I tasted the consequences and learned what a white lie was. 13. The year of shame and embarrassment. Of first kisses on coach buses and wondering when it would be my turn. Of greasy pizza on paper plates and stealing Diet Coke when my parents left for dinner because mom thought it would give us cancer. I flirted with abstract thinking and intuition and learned that I was bad at math. 14, the year I wasted money on makeup and asked my mom for purple eyeliner. The year I knew she was right, but wore it anyway. The year my grandma told me, you look prettier without makeup, and I swore she was lying. Ex-boyfriends and tight shirts were trending. The principal banned spaghetti straps and salt because we couldn't handle either, apparently. What would she say now? 15. The year I formed opinions about the world. The year I learned that I was allowed to have my own. Drugs were cool and so were older boys. The year of crop tops, train rides to Connecticut and five paragraph essays. 16. The year I thought I got my heart broken and cried for days. The year I played hickey and ate Chinese chicken and broccoli on the couch with diet Sprite on a Tuesday afternoon. Boys can be mean, girls can be meaner. The year I learned how to take the high road and had no choice but to believe that everything happens for a reason. 17, the year my future became a real possibility. The year of anxiety in my shoulders, weight on my chest and kindness in my heart. The year I cried so hard that I couldn't go to school. The year I got on a plane to Georgia and imagined a life for myself that I knew I'd never choose. The year I felt pretty and superior. 18, the year of new beginnings that I forgot were possible. The smell of new furniture and the sound of chatter from 50 different states stole my sleep. The year I laughed for real for the first time in months and made my best friend over a drunken midnight sandwich run. Cheap heels, multiple choice questions, and Mongolian food in plastic takeout containers were the backdrop of my life. 19, adulthood. The year my parents became my friends and I realized they weren't perfect. The year I ate glazed donuts in a full-size bed and finally slept through the night. A new backpack was the promise of a new beginning and old boots were the promise of tradition. The year I fell in love in an airport line for shitty breakfast food and was too scared to open my mouth. 20, the year I learned that I was in control of my own life. The year I let myself picture what happiness might look like if only I had the strength. The year I took a 747 plane to London and stayed up for 37 hours straight. The year I slept on a loft bed and was disappointed by my best friend. The year I read a yellow book that seemed to read my mind. 21, the unwritten year that is almost complete. The year I held myself accountable. The year I became friends with late hours of the night on long distance phone calls to Texas. The year I realized how tired I am. Pink pillows, fake flowers, and cheap candles dot my virtual life on screens that are starting to hurt my eyes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Our next reader tonight is Jared Elters Dempsey, 22 years young, is a student athlete studying sociology at University of Pennsylvania. Jared has a passion for the arts and spends his free time cultivating his eye for photography, his ear for music and his writing hand for poetry and memoir. He hopes one day to release his memoir, recounting a distinct journey of desolation and discovery. His quarantine survival guide consists of frequent photo shoots, curating playlists on Spotify, and maintaining a newfound vegan diet. Please welcome Jared. Awesome. Uh, I just want to start by saying I'm very glad to be here. Um, thank you to all the viewers who are here to support um, all of these lovely artists and posts tonight. Um, yeah, and I'm just glad to, to be in this virtual space with you all. Um, so I'll aim to share two of my works from this past semester. Um, shout out to my class. Uh, I really appreciated all the, the times that we shared. Um, thank you for helping me to become a better writer. Thank you, Professor Brown. Um, and uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll begin with a piece entitled The Search for Self. Fervent searching falls short when we lose sight of what has already been found. I find that I must mine and chip away at myself so that the dust may clear and what appears is the real, not the ideal. But forget that, it's not the goal. You would think that it's too far-fetched to see the current state as enough. Yes, 
You two were born into the mold, too quickly sketched into a me that fills society's cup, but not your own. I is easily found when I neglect what is here and now, and I put the future on repeat. Uncovering the cowl that covers what I ought to be, I can never be who I am then without manifesting who I am now. But forget that. There's no time for this thing called me. A foreign concept, lost as I greet deadlines and carefully calculated benchmarks with nothing. Seldom a crumb of what could be so apparent, so natural that it oozes off the skin, that it glows from within. The identity that is so often created for oneself is parasite to the root. At the root of it all, we're people with thoughts and dreams and ideas and ambitions. But spotlights turn even mirrors into masked informants. We have come to accept our true selves as something else. Something less vibrant than the broad stroke that peer pressure paints. The identity that is so often created for oneself is parasite to the root. At the root of it all, we're people with thoughts and dreams and ideas and ambitions. The spotlights turn even mirrors into masked informants, leading oneself to lie untouched and unrealized. We have come to accept our true selves as something else, something less vibrant than a broad stroke that peer pressure paints, an old picture on the shelf collecting dust in the dark as it portrays what could be so painfully apparent and constantly present. Do you not realize the gift of the present or is your true identity just decoration on the wall of your soul? From the sole of your feet to the crown of your crown, you are called to royalty, but, but, but nothing. Do not forget that, it's time to own it. After all, you at least owe it to you to be more than that one standard. The standard of yourself that suffocates your potential, squeezing out every ounce that can of the real you. Fervent searching will never fall short when you embrace everything that you are. Um, that is my first piece and I now transition to my second piece entitled The Chest. In 2007, I filled a time capsule with pain. Chuckles, trips, idealism, dreams. I buried them deep into purple dirt. It was easier to leave them behind and burrow forward. I didn't dig. The ground swallowed them for me. Fragments of foreshadowed trauma and portions of delight. I tucked them all neatly into a chest made of tears. The silent ones. But it followed me. No matter how far I flew, the past shadowed me, maybe not on the surface, but deep within the seas and the earth. There was a chest that was crushed, like a tomato playing catch up. It created a labyrinth beneath my feet while staying discreet. Like Punxsutawney, moments from my past would pop up and give reports. Cold, pink, numb fingers, like that of my young winters, gave me a feeling that resembled my response toward these uprisings. Painful nothing, but this wasn't good for me. Blue buses to trains to foreign taxis to pastures of no more protection. No place was an adequate umbrella for the earthquakes to come. The chest, made of formerly filled rivers that sprinted down my cheeks, grew into billboard signs everywhere I went. Those now arid valleys felt the chilling winds of higher altitudes. Maybe I was growing, climbing ant-sized steps. But even if I was, the past definitely had an elevator. It's likely that one day I'd stop to dig it all up. Who knows when that rooster will crow? But what if that day was today? The sun rose on green and white treetops and fell on delicate cheeks like mine. Too much of what I thought was over was only coming to life. That chest, the one covered and filled to the brim with raw liquefied emotion, and needed to wash my warm autumn evening colored eyes clean. I dove to the loudest part of the Azore Sea and surfaced on an island of reddish pink sand. There I began to read, each grain of sand bearing a love letter with my name on it. There, I was no longer a pirate that seeks the comfort of another's treasures. I was a child at a gumball machine, turning the knob to my own treasure. But the sweetness didn't last. The memories of bitter coffee breath and cigarette smoke. An epic chase of remote controlled cars circled around my heart. 
some Mickey Mouse shaped pancakes that are harder to make than they look. Unwelcome spiders, rude sirens, blue and red flashes and heavy book bags. My chest felt the weight of a manatee as the chest began to explode. Times that I just wanted to forget were unloaded from the sky like confetti, but something about it made me feel like a dandelion seed in the sun. And it changed me for the better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jared. Our next reader is Sophia DeRose. Sophia DeRose is a 21 year old ex circus performer and current writer from Florida, unfortunately, who now lives in Philadelphia studying English with a concentration in creative writing at University of Pennsylvania. Her work has appeared in literary magazines such as Rainy Day Magazine, Revelry, National Poetry Mag Magazine, and Apricity. Her first book of poetry, Losing Teeth, was published by Shanti Press in May of 2019. She lives with her pet pug, Midge. If you like puns or pugs, you should follow her Twitter account at DeRose Mary's Baby. Please help me in welcoming Sophia. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, Jared, that was um, amazing, and it's tough to follow, but I also want to say thank you to everyone who's tuning in and listening. Um, so this poem is entitled Sewer Slide. Um, tropisms, definition. Interior movements that proceed and prepare our world and actions at the limits of our consciousness. Here lie my interior movements that proceed and prepare our words and actions as funneled through the limits of my consciousness, existing within the approximation of language and put into the world to be judged. There's so much I don't want to do. My body is clogged by clutterous and murderous rage, spreading ugliness, daily tasks offing themselves, offering themselves to my inked up sighs. Less the body I wanted to leave or left wanting. Sometimes I think I've lost my knack for seduction. A back's contour fits most suitably in the slope of a stomach when you can feel the disrespectful divisioning of space. Keep singing, keep singing, keep singing, keep slinging, keep slaughtering, keep an interesting and impossible command. Do not open wide your palm to catch the frozen pox, the petrified paradise in the middle of slurring December. December and I have a lot in common actually. Do not open the front door. Your name is not possibility for God's sake. Do you know what could happen if you open the door or window or basement to every knock? Do you know everything I've always wanted to share with you? Do you know I can't sing, but I sing every day. I run every day because every night I dream about running. Santa Claus is capitalism's wet dream, doling coal as a way to ash black the poverty-stricken children who steal from corporations like CVS when their stomachs grumble red and faces freckle sickly green. The last time a friend told me I looked pretty, he also called me a fairy. I want a fairy for president. I want zero presidents. To be fair, I don't actually know what I want other than a good night's sleep where I don't dream about running off the edge of some imagined cliff where I don't catch my breath in tandem with the line of the wind, where I wake up feeling like I've done something good for my body other than lull it into a state of tampered actuality, a taboo vacuum of stolen and equally illegible desire. Listen to me. I cannot be both listened to and known. Touched, cloned, together and forever are stupid categories. I'd rather be hot. The violent panopticon that we live with outside is a rainbow or a baby shower. What I wanted is needing to have unbearable inertia or maybe unwearable in her, but what I got is in favor of a crowded sense of self-hiding. Maybe I'm just a little confused about the face in the horizon. Doesn't everybody see themselves in the smile of a new planet in every setting and rising storm? Sin? I don't know her. Son? I am him. Sign? I have no one to co-sign my student loans, but money is just a synonym for fulfilled desire. And everyone knows fulfilled desire can taste like burning your tongue on hot words, spitting out blood into cupped hands and drinking it back refreshed by rejection and regret. Control is a con artist. It's in the spelling. 
I'm itchy and I'd rather be saying absolutely nothing than be saying stay, please. What if I told you I wrote this with no reason to write it down? Would that make sense to you? It might if you also have no reason to be written down. A memorial is an ice skating rink for forgotten and scissored dreams, a dozen cocktails, I beg. I think everything is boring after a certain amount of time or intention. An ode to death is always written for a pointy point. Boundaries always feel real into your, in your feet until your feet have been broken. Blobs have no shape until your body's walls disintegrate. Home is a four-letter word until you realize every four-letter word rhymes with ouch. Walking is good until you walk into walls and then up the sides of walls and all the way to the roof up until you're down. If I could see the way people looked at my back, I'd probably like myself more. Isn't that a confession that would make Pope Francis say, yes, queen? I've been reprimanded for saying the word stuff within stuffy walls as I breathe stuffy air and stuff myself as if stuff isn't an amazing word. Stuff your shut up. Tomorrow is a birthday, not mine. Let's celebrate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sophia. Our next reader is Isabella Zhang. She is a freshman in the college, currently studying from home in New Jersey. One of her comforts over quarantine, especially in moments of deep angst, is re-watching clips from Disney's Up. Please help me welcome Isabella. Thank you so much, Lainey, and thank you also to my classmates and workshopies for creating such a beautiful space. Um, this is September. Come summer, we take the good film and spool it out. Good, a still life, the world aloft in our limbs. It goes like this, crick, creak, the rubbery latches giving. We sling ourselves from monkey bars, yellow fleshed, sweat slick. Your salt skin, my knees taut, we let her fur go out. And in the high sun, our bodies unlatch themselves in the shapes we haven't known. The jut of bone, the faint pucker of muscle, unwanted spells of flesh. Still we play, we strip. Our stark selves, we couldn't give two shits. We're learning the lunge and thrust of cusses and all our sweet words are spat. Drunk on so much air, we talk of this and this. Shifting of small cloths, curled hair, elbows flailing, finicky in their new length hands clutching for a foothold in sheer air. We scuffle, we tumble, land square in a tangle of limbs. Huh, fuck. We wonder aloud how we'd look if we grasp at some sort of symmetry. I look for it, the edge of a smile playing at your lips, find none. How we'd look, one cup throughout the other. In my dumb tongue, my head full of bees, I'm floundering for speech. I try living godless this summer, but what do you believe I pray to you in secret? By night, Timid, I, I grace the odd thoughts of my body, lurch into sleep on the hot shame of you. This much I promise, if only to believe that I am girl enough, enough to touch. For you, I think, I will be a kept boy. I will be a bird. If only to fumble into words. Come summer, how you choke the sounds of big hands. The slick, the scrabble, you pick off buttons like thumb scabs. You tip me a little this way, and your eyes, your eyes, I am afraid of you. You tutor. Pat of a finger, map in my mouth. My lips a little fist sewn shut. My meek teeth, the cold clench, the wet tremor, the, the sharp plunge of that. I see it still. Hands hushed in my lap like a roving bird. Your fingernail thick of it, oh, and the startle of blood. It isn't theft when it wants to be taken. After, in the mirror, my body, my strange face, I fold back into myself. When you leave, I lift my eyes, glimpse the trees, the leaves like pearled claws. Even in the golden summer, we are but dogs struggling toward other dogs. Second and last of all, this is fissures. Here and there come nightfall, I am taken by memory. I am kidnapped, kept and kept quiet with no tongue to beat, like a lamb with the edge of metal at her neck, until quietly, my hunger bleeds out. I know this, I can clock my earliest memory at two years old, at the core of it is my mother, Ma, one who would feed fish to mouth of a river. I know this. She took me into the shower with her one night. 
I can remember the cold shock, the wet horror, my mother's nakedness gleaming, seal skin. The steam tucking me into a daze, trying to work out whether it was nap time or not. And the floor slick with lather, my balance te teetering just so, then slipping all at once on the soapy tile. Striking my head on the faucet, the flux, the flash of metal and blood. Exhausted, I imagine, by the overstimulation, I elected to break into the kind of blood curdling sobs that baby haters hate. Ma looked down at me. I remember her face, the vagueness of it, and not because memory is weird and janky or anything, but the blankness, like a, like a full moon, it frightened me. As if straining toward recognition, she looked and looked at me. She may have frowned. She opened the door and let me out. I know this and this and how all I've wanted since is to know what it is to be wanted back. Years slip by in the lurching way to do, and the night falls sweetly. In the other room with eyes shut, I can see it as certainly through the clapboard between us. Ma's face turned to meet the ceiling, each expanse as cold and as cool and flat as the other. Hone stones. Ma's face, all poker, no shit. But then in the din, a murmur like the glint of something siphoned through a vent. A fragile static which ruptures, and then a violence of sobs. Pity uncoils. It is poison to hear it, my mother, Ma, one who wouldn't falter from taking a belt to my back. Ma, one who would poker me into submission. Ma, Ma, and whimpering like this. A small and twisted animal kicked to the dirt. How feeble. I'm sickened by it. And as soon as I'm sickened, I feel the shame staggering in, catastrophic, taking me of it into the night. After this, it's as if a rim of thin skin has been peeled back. It's like waking, it's like waking from a midday dream. I begin to notice other things, things other than the moon of her face. Like how Ma eats, pushing each morsel to the, to the edge of her molars, chewing powerfully a horse. How she walks, gliding along new ice. How at home, Ma takes it with softer speed. She saves the tender sides of hog meat to dry. She pounds turtle shells to a powder. She praises the virtues of the zodiac. She rants about the, the elixirs that will heal her. She gets a melon in the light of dawn. She creates passcodes like uttering wishes into the universe. King and peace of mind was most recently the key to the home computer. Fushi, study, her Yahoo account, which has since slipped into disuse. Kaishin, happy, her Gmail account. I cannot understand them. The contradictions in Ma, her science mind, her folk medicine, straddling the weird edge between realism and magic. My mother, Ma, one who would stoop for Angelica's. Sometimes I wonder what she means for us to think when we use the computer. I wonder how she looks, eyes shut, lips puckered, as if to confer a wish, as if she is waiting for love, a foot for luck to come home. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Our next reader, Mia Marion, is a poetry obsessed senior in the college studying English and classical studies. Mia's COVID survival routine has been getting into cooking, making scrambled eggs four times a week, producing bad watercolor paintings, and taking incredibly long walks around the beautiful city of Philadelphia. Please help me in welcoming Mia. Thank you, Lainey, and thanks everyone who's here tonight. I'm nervous to follow after so many amazing poets, um, but I was really inspired by Joe Brainerd's book, I Remember, a book that we read over this semester. So I decided to write my own, I Remember, and that's what I'm going to be reading tonight. I Remember. I remember the nausea that swept over me the night I got my first migraine after eating too many pancakes in the confusingly lit neon diner by the movie theater. I remember the softness of the knit socks my cousin bought for me from the dollar store seven Christmases in a row. I remember the taste of the tuna fish patty my mother made me eat as I cried salty tears straight into it, repeating over and over again that I wanted to be a vegetarian, but I needed protein. I remember walking through Richard Serra's immense spiraling steel sculptures hung over. I remember the rough texture of the wart that was stuck on my knee from ages seven to nine. I remember the distinct feeling of my second to last toe sliding up against the paper mache box of my point shoes in ballet class and knowing instantly that the top layer of skin had peeled off to form a big bloody blister. I remember crying on every birthday I've had. 
I remember that hives that broke out on my legs the day I found out I didn't get into Princeton that looked as though I had dug my fingernails into my skin over and over again, but didn't hurt at all. I remember a coldness permeating through my body after Hannah's Halloween party sophomore year. And I remember the swishing of my Clinique makeup bag as I emptied the contents into the trash the next day. I had sworn off eyeliner. I remember the static sounds from the TV that was on outside the NICU in Pennsylvania Hospital. It was always switched to PBS and I watched Dragon Tales alone while the rest of my family was inside. I remember the theme song to Dragon Tales, sung by a purple and green dragon. I remember stepping on a wooden block in the playroom the morning my sister was born, feeling confused to find my parents gone and my grandmother asleep on the futon. I remember hearing the words premature, NICU, blind, deaf, internal brain bleeding, mild cerebral palsy, and not knowing what they meant. I remember my mom's expression as she told the story of my own birth. I was two weeks early and she craved broccoli the whole pregnancy. She didn't have an epidural. And as I came out, she screamed, I'm gonna fucking die. She was in so much pain. When she recounted this part, she screamed at me, I'm gonna fucking die so that I could, so that I could get the full picture. And then I popped out crying a lot. And two hours later, she pulled on her lucky brand jeans from before the pregnancy and the doctors and nurses all clapped. I remember how quiet it happened with the baby after me, like it just slipped out of her. I remember peeling her eyelids open with my thumb and my pointer finger and saying, mom, can we do spin art? I remember ignoring the words bed rest, miscarriage and postpartum depression, not knowing they were bad. I remember seeing my little sister for the first time, swaddled by the nurses tightly in the dimly lit hospital ward. I tugged at my dad's shirt, wide-eyed and whispered, dad, our baby has no arms or legs. I remember the beep on the answering machine on my fourth birthday, but instead of a message from an aunt or an uncle, there was a message from Nurse Helen, Nurse Helen saying that our baby was ready to come home. I actually don't remember if I cried that birthday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mia. Our next reader, Mir Elias, was born in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and came of age in the United States, where she has lived for the past three decades. Mir's poetry, photography, and videography attempt to evoke feelings using the unexpected juxtaposition of words and images, as well as explore the notion of bioregionalism in art practice, our relationship to that which is vaster than us, the unspoken truth of things as they are, and the permanent state of otherness. For a cozy pandemic winter read, Mir suggests revisiting the classics Wind in the Willows and Alice in Wonderland. And for lovers of horror revived as social commentary, she recommends The Walking Dead on Netflix and Lovecraft Country on HBO. Please help me welcome Mir. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Thank you for tuning in. And thank you to my classmates for reading such beautiful, intimate works. And Professor Brown for a wonderful semester. So when I was a teenager, I struggled to understand surrealist paintings. In my 20s, I struggled through novels written in the magic realism style. And later, I struggled through post-modernist poetry mirroring the fractured post-World War II landscape. In this class, we collectively struggled through experimental memoir and, uh, um, and poetry. So here is my offering of three poems in a series in the same vein, uh, you know, uh, surrealism and magic realism, experimental memoir and poetry in the same vein for these times. So if there is a particular turn of phrase you like, feel free to drop it in the chat, please. So the series is called The Fiction of Deserted Hearts and it's in three parts. Nowhere. We were cast out of the shadows of empire as inherent forces of rot. It took us a long time to realize that the fate of lost moments is precisely not to realize their fates. 
In the deserts, corpses in love begged for their eyes to be spared from beasts that had gone hungry for days, while the camels left the caravan of love without even saying goodbye. One morning, I hear a crow for the first time announcing the departure of the geese as fireflies mistake dawn for twilight and green leaves rain down on the corn-shorn fields of gold. There are whispers everywhere that the unassailable privilege of plastics has created a climate of intimidation. But we, we created by violence, but not creatures thereof, we know that drops of blood on cotton, like milk on steel, washes away with cold water. We know that when the skin is flayed, the first drops display reluctance in flowing outside their arterial home. We know that those who believe in an afterlife are envious of the life here and now. We know that the crack of dawn is a whip on the back. We know that knowledge has no purpose, no end. We know that to read the world is a barbaric act suitable only for prophets. It's true that we've forgotten not only to speak, but also the algorithms of translation for the one refrain that means surrender to an intentional hope for the uncertain, fallible future of yes, inshallah. Meanwhile, the native gardens are burning with the ice of disenfranchisement, with the translucent taxonomy of subjugation, with the connective scar tissue of empire, from which the hearts of deserted nameless roses are multiplying to consume the barren land of ideas. Here, the daisies start rioting in the streets as Venus takes last watch guarding the horizon's ramparts. The impending blue moon sp spills its secrets to the foxes on television. The wheat flowers bleached in the dark crane out of concrete to display their zeal for hurling thorns, forgetting for a moment their ancient obsession with fastidiousness. The leaves, young and oak, begin to tinsel as each molecule of moisture becomes hostage to past mistakes. Somewhere soon, the waves will be marching towards the singing stars. They too will succumb to the conspiracy of feathers to leave us behind, but what of that? Everyone knows that the sun was captured last year in sparkly tassels and the sky became a rose on the days when it wasn't busy being a lucid pearl. So what if the trees have settled on a rare magenta eschewing all the yellows? In past wrongs, evenings, rose and fell in unison with the crackle of spines still unbent despite the punishment for audacity. We were naive to fret about the fate of earthworms because butterflies make the best mothers when spent flowers are deadheaded one by one. And all the while, our stories crumble from the assault of timely silverfish. Somewhere, the long-lasting solitude of life is pounding at the door of naked kings. Madness influences peak excitement throughout the lands. We take refuge in a closet room full of mushroom mold, polished and heavy with fear. Recollections of distant foggy paths, lined with glacine camellias, roses and grapes, refuse to leave our sides. This makes having to leave all the more difficult. Suddenly, I remember that the fruit flies were left to multiply unobserved in the washing machine. Outside, the air, heavy with violet longings, rises up among the Norway spruce to perch over the tiny fences that only serve to conquer grass in the name of unassailable birthright. Through the barbed wire, the shine resists the dulling effects of light on the glowing dreams of other climes, dreams that turn specially cruel when the north wind blows. 
Even the invading bugs hang on every molecule, flooding the streams with the crow's plaintive howl at the moon's deception. And all the while, generations of feelings are spun into fictions of deserted hearts. And a divine marionette billows, a divine marionette billows with preoccupation at her scattered desk, looking up long enough to hug the seas and tell them that the mountains are coming and not to worry about the singing stars. Like the late great Leonard Cohen, may we ride the waves of chaos with a state of grace. Thank you for listening. Have a safe and warm holiday season and new year. If you're observing Hanukkah today, happy Hanukkah. Stay well and thank you. Thank you so much, Mir. <clears throat> Maria Elena Mukio is a sophomore enrolled in Penn's dual degree program, receiving a degree in marketing from Wharton and a degree from the College in Cinema and Media Studies. She is an avid singer, songwriter, dancer, and reader of poetry. Her quarantine survival trick was long nature walks and disposable cameras, they can make the most dull day look like a 90s movie clip. Please help me welcome Ria Elena. Hi, it's such an honor to be here, just echoing what everyone has said. Um, this class has been incredible, the friends I have made, the space we created, and it's all thanks to Professor Brown, so thank you. Thank you a million. Um, I would love to read two works of fiction today. And um, the first is based on an author we read in class, a quote from him, um, but many facts about a life should be left out and they are easily replaced. And from that inspiration, I wrote a poem called Memory Suppression. He told her he wanted her. He told her he, her. He told her he cared for her, even loved. Her heart beat to the rhythm of a scared snare as the hand in her chest squeezed and suffocated and moths swarmed. Her heart beat to the rhythm of a, as the, in her chest. Her heart beat to the rhythm of dreams by Fleetwood Mac and butterflies in her chest fluttered frivolously. He said to her softly, all he knows is the art of tearing hearts. He said to her softly, he spoke to her softly. His fingers sent chills across her shoulders and arms as every hair stood up at attention. His fingers sent chills as every hair stood up. His fingers sent chills through her body and as his hands gently caressed, every hair stood up glad. He did it. He, it. He didn't do it. He would never, not to her. He said he was special. She was special, different. She didn't say she wanted to. She didn't say. She didn't say she didn't want to. He said goodbye, that was fun. He said goodbye, that was, he said goodbye, can't wait to see you later. A girl from a tiny town, but with big movie dreams of love, dreams that somehow led to a planet of disillusions and doubt. A girl from a tiny town with dreams, dreams that somehow led, led to a planet. A girl from a tiny town with dreams that somehow led to a planet, she was lucky to inhabit, even as an alien. A happy girl whose smiles became sleepy and tears became rapids as the hand in her chest squeezed her dry like a lemon. A happy girl whose smile, lemon. A happy girl whose smile remained as life gave her luck and lemons. She didn't sleep a second that night, staring at the ceiling fan carousel and bearing in its misery. She didn't sleep a second that night, staring at the ceiling fan carousel and its, its, she didn't sleep a second that night, lost in the ceiling fan carousel, thinking about the sweet memory she had just made. And transitioning into my second piece, also a work of fiction. Um, this is called The First Time I Kissed a Boy. My classmates know this one well. <laughs> the first time I kissed a boy, he was much older than I was. He had just eaten nuts before kissing me. I'm allergic to nuts. The first time I kissed a boy, I went into anaphylactic shock. Growing up, I always wanted a puppy, but never got one. The first time I kissed a boy, I had to stab myself with an EpiPen. I had the biggest dreams before college. 
War seems so far away. So does Lebanon. There my dad survived his school bus being bombed because there was a cross on it. All his daughter has to complain about is homework. And she still complains. The first time I kissed a boy, the EpiPen stabbing happened right in front of him. He looked like he was about to throw up. My mother always believed in my actress dreams. She's a beautifully naive woman. The first time I kissed a boy, I told my mom right after, as she was taking me to the ER. My dad wanted me to be a doctor, like my mom, to save other girls who had kissed boys and went into anaphylactic shock. My dad says my laugh heals all ills. Sorry if these details are getting boring. I find nothing more insulting than boredom. It's an insult to life itself. There is no acceptable reason to be bored. I'm jealous of men as their grays and salt and pepper beards only serve to increase sex appeal, adding flavor and spice and sodium. I'm afraid that as my face fades, so will people's love for me, that with the appearance of each wrinkle, my appealingness will disappear. The thing I hate most about myself is materialism. The thing I have too much of is empathy. The thing I like most is my poorly thought out but always well executed jokes. The first time I kissed a boy, he said I had beautifully colored lips. It's because they were turning purple. Retro sunglasses, floppy hats, works of fiction and Nutella make the world make sense. My first life crisis happened at Kmart when I was nine and my dad mentioned his eventual death. But you have life insurance, I told him with tears in my oversized Bambi eyes. I sat on the Kmart sidewalk with my head in my hands and cursed the dumbass who misnamed life insurance so wrongfully. Life is never insured. I feel funny starting a sentence with the word life as if my 19 years on this earth have taught me enough to start preaching philosophy. The first time I kissed a boy, I waited for him to text me if I was okay. I'm anxious all the time, but I never stop smiling, so it balances out. I pretend I'm trilingual, but it's more like one and three quarters. People take my bubbliness as disingenuous. The first time I kissed a boy, he never spoke to me again. I guess he didn't like my purple lips. It's okay though, because he used too much tongue, but of course my 15 year old self couldn't tell he was a shit kisser. The second time I kissed a boy, I was 16, and I asked him if he had had nuts that day. He raised his eyebrows. He hadn't. My lips stayed red. So did my cheeks out of embarrassment. The third time I kissed a boy, I was 17. I didn't ask, just kissed. The EpiPen was in my pocket though, just in case. And this piece was called um, The Art of Admitting based on an author who admits every part of their life um, un unapologetically, but both works of fiction, of course. A thank you again so much, everyone, for tuning in. I know my parents are watching and they were referenced a few times. Um, so, so thanks for being good sports, guys. And I've loved this class. I love everyone in this class. And thank you again, Professor Brown, for um, taking my writer's block away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria Elena. Olivia Dwyer is a senior from Delaware studying computer science and minoring in creative writing. During quarantine, she has loved rereading favorite childhood books and biking and running around Philly. She recommends the everything but the bagel seasoning at Trader Joe's to everyone. Please help me welcome Olivia. Thank you, Lainey, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to be reading two pieces tonight, and the first is called Color Wheel, and it's a collection of many of the moments that have made me feel alive. Thick with the pain of wanting, the exhilaration of being close, the colorful shoes. She took a photo of our feet that day for her art project. A thick rain fell later, spray painting on the yellow bricks, the shh sound of the canister squatting in our skirts running around asking questions we knew the answers to. His head bobbed up and down the waves, his hair plastered to his head. The ice cream dripped onto my hand, sticky, bold because I knew he was listening, laughing too loudly. Sitting in the back seat when you were young with a parent sitting next to you, screaming as you go up and down hills. The place I had been every year since I was 13, where I sprinted too hard in the first 10 seconds of a race, where I was injured, 
where my parents took me to the fairy garden when I was young and I dressed up in old fancy clothes. Fingers frozen, watery hot chocolate with too sweet powder at the bottom. My memories from when I was five, all of them blurry and warped by retold stories. The photo we have where I'm staring angrily at the camera because of some forgotten fight. November and fall, the first day where you feel too cold. Clocks. Swimming at sunset, the water pink and frothy, that first gasp of shock when it hits you. The beach in March, the streets empty and barren. Unread, no response. Red, no response. The waiting. The buzz of wine out of plastic cups around a fire. Reunions with people you don't know whose names are repeated to you over and over, who pinch your cheeks and ask how old you are. The kind of all-you-can-eat buffet that you wear elastic pants to. The look in his eyes when he sees you with your clothes off for the first time. And uncorking. The laughter in between, so out of place but so in place at the same time. He did car seats. He did anything. Once I went somewhere where even the towel racks were heated. Your laundry out of the dryer when you just want to crawl inside and never emerge. A triangle-shaped therapist in a too bright office sitting across from you on the couch. Empty used bottles on the deck in the light of a Saturday morning. A restaurant across the world, a hole in the wall, all you can eat bread and soup and beer. Getting to the airport too early and realizing you could have slept in. The trek back up Cockburn Street at 8 p.m. Forgetting. Forgetting the names of the buildings and then the streets and the faces and the memories taking a chance to tell someone how you feel and regretting it. A meal you wish you hadn't eaten, a small ice cream cup you wish you still had. The moment before you send something you know you shouldn't. The first moment of silence after the call ends when you're left in the dark. Buying a bike and riding too fast around the city on his heels. Cranking up the speaker with the playlist of safe songs. Safe because you know you will like them. Watching people reading something you wrote, your heart beating too hard listening to a song through someone else's eyes. Long car rides to somewhere that is not your home, drinking one more glass than you should, crossing paths with someone you think you could have loved but never saying anything, potlucks, ordering a too expensive drink, leaving a tip you can't afford, the fiery debate of friendly but bitter voices over a game that doesn't matter, realizing all of a sudden that you've made a new friend, being too comfortable around people you barely know. And my next piece is called Under Witness of the Moon. A future she had hoped for, gone, whisked from under her with seemingly no warning. She would later tell her therapist there had been warning signs, but whether she had plucked those from thin air or not, she wouldn't know. It fell hard and unforgiving. It let the crops die. They withered without the sun. She withered without the sun. An endless night, it seemed. The dawn was far away and seemingly unreachable. She stumbled through a maze of corn that threatened to close in on her. Her eyes adjusted, but only enough to make out the shapes of monsters emerging from the hedges. The stars were dark. Losing her mind, she drew shapes in them, told stories, willed herself to go on. She didn't know up from down, from left, from right. Sleeping could have been awake, dreaming of losing consciousness. When she was asked, years down the road, how she had escaped, she could not tell them. I walked and I sat and I cried and I spoke, she said only. I looked for the moon. The moon dripped across the sky, marking the only passage of time, a sliver to half a dime, to a bright bulbous flower, to an empty spanse of sky. And again, and again, and again. It was many moons before she made any sense of it. From rusty red to golden, to innocent yellow, to slate gray, it moved and it turned and it teased her. She found a lake and stripped down there, dove into it. Was she numb or did the coldness of the water wake her up, release her, shock her to her senses? She dove deeper. She took deep hollow gulps of air, no, of salty brackish water that passed right through her, propelled her on. Her toes touched the bottom or was it the top? She cried for home, for him, for them, for him. Her hair stood above her, billowed around her, formed into a cave where she curled up and refused to budge hearing no answers. The waves carried her to the shore where under witness of the moon, strange creatures covered her in moss and pebbles and built her a boat and pushed her gently into the waters. She forgot the names of all the places she had come from. She belonged only to the land. 
She started anew. She made friends with the stars. Most of all, she forgot the sun. When dawn hit after many moons, she lulled herself awake. Time turned upside down without warning. She woke up, or did she fall asleep again? She found herself on a bed of her own hair. The brightness blinded her. No, too fast, don't. She stayed in the shadows. She missed the stars. She could no longer swim without gasping for air. She climbed trees and sung to the moon's memory. The sun called to her, yearning to be noticed, streaming light across her face until she was roused awake every day without fail. It was always the same shape, too bright to look in the eyes, and blared a path across the sky every day without fail. It never stayed hidden. She caught her breath again, resigned herself to the brightness, relearned the names of her homes, of people that claimed they knew her. Her crops grew again. She grew, leaning towards the sun. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Jill Pesci is a senior majoring in computer science and minoring in creative writing who loves the outdoors, traveling, and trying new restaurants in Philly. Her COVID survival tip is to pick up a new hobby to keep life interesting. Hers is rock climbing. Please help me welcome Jill. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone who has read so far. You've all been truly inspiring. And thanks to Lainey for facilitating all of this. Um, I'll be reading two poems tonight, the first of which is called The History of Skin. Skin saw the sun and warmed, toasted into tan, freckled into dotted frolics, red with blush burnt regret. Sun seemed mellow, but turned skin red. Aloe soaked slow into sore skin. Skin covered by fabric always until it can be released, even briefly. Kept warm or cool by cotton, leather, linen, layered up and over sweater after sweater, concealed and muffled and smothered. Skin burnt, blistering under boiling oil. Brave skin reached an oven, cowering skin recoiled, trembling, soak with cold water and hope scars don't stain. Another oven victim. Skin celled, melded, body's largest organ, Organ, human shield, fights, wins, and protects against intruding brooders. Fingerprints fill, swirling passport prints. Skin wet by the world's waters, has come alive under rain, rolling and sticking and rolling. Has dried when clothes have not, has salted when water went. Salty with sweat, pouring out of pores to glisten the body. Dripping glistens shine. Skin caressing and caressed, touched lightly by the skin of another played with and coddled and loved and kissed until skin tingled under tickling fingers, swooned under lips and crawled under fingertips. Skin soft, running water, free of blemishes like fresh air, wrapped around the skin of another, hand wrapped around a father's finger, grasping tightly onto a big world when the skin was smooth and paper-like in a world full of scissors. Skin peeled back by words, by touch, by love, Revealed flesh to those who promised they were worthy, promised they would look, not touch. With each echoing word, skin peels back slightly, slides away, easy to be slayed. Skin crinkled and wrinkled with the wreckage of time, taking in the heart's beating pain, baking into skin slowly and solemnly. Natural tattoos, pleated perusions, abstract speckles, furrows, and creases. Smooth again. Skin blackened, blued, yellowed, bruised, stung to the touch, begged to be left alone, isolated, aloof, wanted to be felt and to feel, but blue begged for abandonment. Bruises isolate, more bruises become. Skin dried, cracked, scabbed, healed, smoothed, tanned, freckled, scraped, burnt, blistered, scarred, peeled, blued, wrinkled, crawled, swooned, skinned. Okay, my next one is um, called Confession. My favorite color is yellow. Yellow like a daffodil and not like lemons, corn, or mustard. Yellow like a flower and not like a food. I'd wear yellow clothes, but I want to be taken seriously. I've been told I don't share enough. I like windows, but I'm afraid of heights. I don't mind an unmade bed. I have never wanted to confess everything. Well, maybe once before my confirmation. 
I always wash my fruit and rarely wash my jeans. I have wished the same birthday wish since I was eight. I'm trying to share more. Seeing blood makes my stomach turn and so does astronomy. I can't tell if I like salad because it's healthy or because I like it. I don't have many male friends. I'm afraid of being boring. And the phrase, tell me about yourself. I think I'll stop sharing now. I hate the smell of Sharpies, but I love the way they write. I like light jackets and loose pants. I prefer red onions to white. The same goes for wine. I don't trust people who squash bugs with their hands. If given the chance to remove all smells, I would. The good ones are not worth the bad. I find it hard to fall in love with men. The good ones are not worth the bad. I'm sharing too much now. People say I'm hard to read, but I say the same about the Odyssey. I wash my sheets every time someone else sleeps in them. I am brought joy more easily than I am brought pain. I like low voices on both women and men. Okay, that's enough. I don't trust people who speak without stuttering. I like kissing people who chew gum and smell like they just showered. This is getting away from me. I have never been addicted to anything. I can't say the same about anyone. I have hurt more than have hurt me, quantity wise. I have been hurt more than I have hurt others, depth wise. I wish it was the other way around. The thought of love makes me uncomfortable. Writing this makes me uncomfortable. Let me start again. My favorite font is E.B. Garamond. I wish I had an unusual birthmark. I lie sometimes for no reason. I don't actually mind the smell of Sharpies. My favorite color is daffodil yellow and I'm harder to read than the Odyssey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. Victoria Sindlinger is an aficionado of nature, especially birds and opera with a soft spot for poetry. She highly recommends the Metropolitan Opera's free nightly streams, nothing like opera to get you through a COVID era winter's night. Please help me welcoming Victoria. Hello everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Brown. And thank you all for being here tonight and letting me share my work with you. I will be reading two poems, the first of which is titled Daydream of a Mountain Night. The dome of Knight's Cathedral arcs high above us, our own campfire a faint echo of those ancient points of celestial power that we call stars. Faintly glowing beacons, the distant snow-capped peaks shine with crystalline whiteness like nature's lighthouses. Andalusia stretches below me, the land mercifully unmarred by electric incandescence. Nature here creates a different symphony, and all around are reminders that this is not my native land. But they, the deep-rooted, brilliant-blooming ecosystem-enlivening trees, accept this adventurous dandelion seed. And I sense that my questions will find an answer. Any nervousness will be soothed. They are the storks, migrating citizens of the world that define Iberia. And I am the hummingbird, a brash visitor from another continent. But we are all wanderers living together in freedom. So here's to all who allowed this expanse of night peace invigorating breeze, gently rebellious liberty song echo to touch me. To the word painters and light catchers, music magicians and letter world makers, I thank you for sharing. Here's to the impossibly unlikely path of infinite serendipitous choices that led to this moment. Here's to the beautiful fact that I love what I love. To every being in the past and the present who altered my path in their own subtle way, I extend my sincerest gratitude. We spend a few precious units of time together seemingly miles away from any other members of our species. Political borders have long since faded, rising away into the vast, richly colored blackness. And the only boundaries we need now obey are those imposed by 
substance, leather, and our own desire. But this cannot last, as nothing can last. As our star continues their inevitable retreat, the fall glowers, numbing, surrounding, and I sink into dormancy, an ocean away. The second poem that I will be reading was inspired by a tragic event that occurred in Philadelphia this past October. It is entitled, The Fall of the Migrants. It was a foggy autumn night, already crisp with northwest winds blowing in an additional chill. Riding those winds were hundreds of thousands of tiny travelers crossing countries, yes, the moon's milky light edged each feather like frost as silken wings rode through ink dark skies. As the night passed, certain migrants were pressed ever lower by a thick ceiling of oppressive clouds. All of a sudden, the ill fated wanderers were enveloped in a blaze of city light. Dazed, they floated down across Philadelphia. Perching in the alien catacomb, they waited out the night as the dawn crept forward, illuminating a blood-stained sky. And it began to rain birds. Block after city block, the innocent creatures of northern woods, desperate to escape, saw at last a sliver of sky or a bow of shelter. Dashing for the mirage, they crashed into gleaming skyscraper glass with deadly speed, never even knowing what killed them. Early risers were greeted with sidewalks strewn with exquisite corpses. Exotic colors covered the streets and rooftops like an art project gone mad. Wounded birds huddled in bushes and watched morning's rush hour as they awaited their own death. Many of the fallen were taken for science, taken also for an appeal to the conscience of corporations. And as they methodically cataloged the hundreds of losses, the bird collectors were moved to tears. Now all we can do is pick up the pieces, see where they fit together and where this puzzle will lead us. Those with compassion for nature have rallied to restore night, armed with passion, petitions, and committed volunteers. We must hope it's enough. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And our final reader tonight, Paula Vecker is a Philadelphia public high school student attending Science Leadership Academy and is in her junior year. She applied to the Young Scholars Program at the University of Pennsylvania in hopes to pursue and further her passion for creative writing and poetry. She is an avid baker, lover of travel and the performing arts. Her hope for the future is to continue her education at Penn and begin activist work for bettering the criminal justice system. Her best quarantine survival tip is to completely bury yourself into any overly lengthy Netflix series you can find. She has her own personal <clears throat> nerdy obsession with true crime documents. What a shocker. Please help me welcome Paula. Hi everyone. Um, I'm sure that <laughs> the intro is kind of getting, you know, uh, annoying, but I just have a lot of love for this class and um, I just want to thank again um, my wonderful classmates and of course Professor Brown. You've truly all um, been inspirations to me through this entire process. Um, so um, uh, a particular reading that I was really captured by was uh, Tropisms by Natalie Serra and um, kind of the perspective she took was using the biological movement of organisms and kind of connecting that to our self-conscious and like irrational energy we experience as humans. So I kind of wanted to take that and further that as my own. So this piece is called Twisted Release of the Occasional Revelation. The chestnut-hued adolescent lays doe-eyed, her fragments echoed, ached in numbness. Coarse, crimped auburn hair, sadly smothered in grease, reeking of something rotten. The depressed daffodil embraces her twig-like limbs, 
the comfortable simulation of a cozy feathered blanket. She invites the flipping of the switch, the confusing yet familiar companion built inside her capsule, the channels embedded in the skull, indeed from the beginnings always triggered and summoned from the savage chilling touch of the cold white tile that cemented the bathroom floor years before. These two obscurities, a relationship particularly non-existent until instructed, dangled like puppets by the mutual understanding of the dangerous and unpredictable nature of the human function. A, mo a moment brought together by the ignitation of toxic electricity, a simple re-encounter sparking the flickers of friendship. The calculated cruel pressure of the hippocampus, the storing of a tissue that keeps on tearing to the harmonic hyper-pounding of the disturbed amygdala, plastic tunnel vision with a born occupation, an edging fear of the alert snapping at any given moment, the hushed feeding of communication with the makeup of sensory signals, a conductor officiating an orchestra with a twisted perfect blend of reminiscence and torture in her head, topped off with the seasonings of blame and self-defecation. The story leaps into the deepest cave of panic, the agitation falls into position as these friends of hers bring back the tune of the story to life once again through the now black flickers in her orbs filled with condensed salt water. The almost identical ivory ceramic squares paved the design of her high school English classroom. The first guided path for the instructor to make a stance in front of the audience full of pre premeditated judgment. It wasn't the nerves that sealed her plush rosy lips like thick gorilla glue but her foreign ab abnormal acknowledgement of the language that everyone else perceived to have the ability to articulate with ease. Each stutter and stumbled word spiraled her deeper into days that only calculated the anticipation of the jolting fall. The American laughter drowned her state of being for it was the most horrid and depictable sound she could understand. The young girl could only believe that she was unsavable from her foreign background for she couldn't fix what she couldn't fully recognize. The howl of her peers triggered the choking of their very own pale bony hands slowly wrapping around her neck, taunting the idea of suffocation as she slumped back into her, into her designated seat. It was the overpowering sense of defeat and humiliation that fueled the daunting internal friendship to start lurking behind her. Whiplash yanked back from the replayed encounters visit from the replayed encounters visit from earlier that day. She's met on the rusted bathroom floor her cotton sweater soaked in warm sweat as she vigorously wipes. They trickle down to the crevices between the ceramic. The exhilarated thumping of her heart signals the powerful dynamic duo's prime time. She trembles, flashes between a sensation of weakness and, re and restlessness as she gulps down nausea that it attempts to climb up from the pit of her stomach. She eyes the pointed metal nail scissors in one of the tiny cabinets next to the mirror. Impulse, she fixates on the running of her icy blue veins, peeking under a fragile layer of the skin on her wrists. She pries them apart as they now resemble sharp individual silver swords, just in time before her stunted breath manages to creep up with another winding attack. The hesitation? Non-existent. No regret. Justifying the predicted relief with a single tap of a pointed finger directed towards the spiteful pair, coexisting as one force of strife. She makes the navigated for a slash. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Paula. And thank you everyone. Thank you to all of our readers tonight. Um, thank you to Kelly Writer's House, to Zach and Nick who are streaming us and to everybody watching live and everybody that will be watching in the future. Thank you so much for joining us. Can we have another round of applause for these wonderful writers? So be well, everyone. Take good care of yourselves out there and we look forward to reading more of your work and hopefully seeing you in person at Kelly Ryder's house in, on the other side of this pandemic. Take good care, happy holidays, and thank you.